Good afternoon, everybody. Ian here with RedlineStands.com, and today I'm going to show you how to install a 9,000 pound two post lift. We did a video like this a few years ago and it did really well for us. Got about 1.2 million views, but it was not really a quality video. So I'm shooting to one up myself today and do better. I'm going to reinstall another one of these 9Ks. I'm going to show you step by step how to do it and everything that I've learned. We've been selling two post lifts at Redline for about a dozen years now and I've learned a lot. I've got an engineering degree. I've, I've got a whole bunch of tips and tricks that I'm going to try and share with you guys about installing one of these lifts. I'm going to put a link down below in the description to our website where you can see all of the two post lifts that we sell. So let's get started. The very first thing I want to say about a two post lift installation is there's two different types. There's a floor plate style and a clear floor style. This one behind me is a clear floor style. You can tell that those towers are about 12 feet long, hence the lift is about 12 feet tall. It would not be the first time that it happened that somebody gets on our website, forgets to check the height of the lift before they order it. They get it in and realize they've got an 11 foot ceiling and a 12 foot lift. They've made a big mistake. Check your specs first. Don't be that guy. While we're on the topic of clear floor versus floor plate lifts, the reason we're installing a clear floor lift behind us in the shop today is because we've got plenty of ceiling height. We can get away with it. I really don't recommend a floor plate style lift unless one of two things happens. Either A, you've got something like a sprinter van with a ton of ceiling height so you need the top of the lift open so you can still raise it up, or B, you've got a low ceiling height in your shop. You simply can't fit it in there. You need a 10 foot tall lift to go in a 10 foot tall shop. I really don't recommend the floor plate units because frankly they're kind of troublesome working around underneath the vehicle. Uh, suppose that you're trying to roll a toolbox, a roll cart, a transmission jack, something like that around underneath the vehicle using a floor plate lift. That plate that runs across the bottom really gets in the way and makes it difficult to roll that stuff around. So I don't recommend a floor plate lift unless you absolutely have to have it. I'm going to put a link in the end of this video to another video that I did that talks about two post lifts and how they're actually rated. There's a lot of misunderstanding out there. And for instance, if you think you're going to put that 8,200 pound diesel on that 9,000 pound two post lift, it's not a good idea due to the weight distribution. So check out that video in the end of this video. You may learn something that'll save you an accident. One of the most common questions that we get from guys that are buying two post lifts from us is where where should I locate it in my shop? And the answer to the question is, I recommend at least 11 feet away from the wall. And the reason that I say that is because the maximum vehicle length of the longest thing you could ever put on your lift is about 22 feet long. Realistically, if you have the space, I recommend 16 feet, which is 11 plus a two foot toolbox up against the wall and three feet of working space. In this particular install we're going to do, and I'm going to show you today, we're going to space it 11 feet away from the wall. And the reason we're going to do that is because of those relief cuts that you can see right there in the concrete. I don't want that lift anywhere near one of those relief cuts, so we're going to do 11 feet. Now let's talk briefly for just a second about concrete. I'm going to put a link in the end of this video to another video that I did that talks about concrete in very great detail as it relates to two post lifts. Definitely watch that. Check it out. There's a lot of really good information in there. You're likely to learn something. The second thing I'll say, check your manual. Not all two post lifts are equal. Some of them have great big base plates. Some of them have small base plates. As a result of that, some of them call for this thickness or that thickness of concrete, as well as different PSI ratings of the concrete and how it is reinforced. So check your manual. Don't just assume that you need 3,000 PSI and four inches of concrete thickness. Now with that said, it's time for us to check the thickness of this slab before we install this lift. So I've got my hammer drill here. You'll notice that I've put a piece of tape around this bit and I've got that piece of tape spaced four inches from the end of my bit. In this shot here, you can see that I'm drilling into the concrete and basically what I'm trying to do is just make sure that when that piece of tape gets even with the top of the slab that I'm still boring into concrete and I haven't hit dirt. If you hit dirt, you'll know it. It'll feel different. It'll sound different. Everything will change. So just test the thickness of your concrete. Make sure that you know you have enough thickness for the lift that you're looking to buy. In this case, we're good to go. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is pop a chalk line across the floor. This helps us to basically align the two lifts. Chris, if you'll hold it right there, pull it good and tight on both ends. And then we're basically just ensuring that our towers are aligned perfectly with where we want them. 
we pop the line on the floor, and we're good to go. There's nothing to standing up one of these things, but you do need two men. Now that you've got your towers stood up, you're just going to kind of shimmy and walk them into place to align them with the marks on your chalk line. By this point, you should have already put marks on your chalk line showing the outside to outside dimension of the base plate as per the specs in the manual. I want to take a second and share something with you that I learned in the past. This particular lift is a one-piece tower, so that entire column is one solid piece of steel. In the event that you had one of these lifts that was a nine-foot tower with a three-foot extension, that basically means the last three feet of it up there at the top bolts into place, do yourself a favor, bolt those in place while the tower is still laying flat on the ground, then raise them up. Don't start trying to carry a three foot piece of tower up a ladder to bolt it in place on the top of your towers. That is the hardest possible way to do that. Okay folks, now it's time to anchor our towers into the concrete. And I wanna stop and share something with you that I've learned. Uh, these anchors have a tendency to get loose over time in the case of a two post lift because you've got all of that torque trying to draw that tower over. And as a result, these things get looser and looser over time. I found a way based on a lot of experience to combat that. I like to use some epoxy called AC100 plus gold to not only expand the anchor in place, but to also glue it in place it goes a long way towards keeping these things nice and tight over the years. Now, I will tell you, this stuff is not cheap. If you think you're going to just walk into Home Depot and Lowe's and find it on the shelf the day before your install, you're probably not. I had to order this stuff. It was 25 bucks a tube. Like anything in the world, you get what you pay for. So expect to give good money for this stuff because it is deserving so. So let's talk about how to use this stuff safely with our concrete anchor. Now a traditional concrete anchor, of course, has this collar right here that travels down this path and expands inside the hole. That works well. Uh, however, what I like to do is glue it in place as well as expand it in place. And so what you're going to see us do here in a minute is we're going to butter up our anchor through here. We're going to drive it into the hole. And this part is terribly important. We're going to start tightening our anchor down and torquing our anchor while our epoxy is still wet. This is terribly important because if you get this wrong, basically what happens here is you have glued your collar in place to where it cannot travel down this tapered path and expand. Band. So it's terribly important that you tighten your anchor in place while your epoxy is still wet. Uh, go ahead and give you a warning right now. In the summertime, this stuff has a, a working time of 30 to 60 seconds. It sets up really, really fast on a 95 degree day. In wintertime, you might have two or three minutes. So be prepared to get that anchor into the ground and get it torqued very, very quickly. One of the other things I want to share with you about these anchors is when I install them, I like to take the nut right there and run it down to the point that the nut is not even with the end of the anchor. One of the things you're probably going to see happen when we start hammering on this is it's going to mushroom the end of that anchor pretty badly as we hit it with a sledgehammer. The last thing that you want to happen is to drive that thing into the concrete. It's then holding your lift in place and it mushrooms out so bad at the top that you can't get the nut in place. So when we install these things, I like to go ahead and have the nut on there. It's important that you watch that nut and make sure that it's not spinning itself off of the anchor as you go. For some reason, as you hit these things with an anchor, they like to start unscrewing themselves. So keep an eye on that. Make sure that you are hitting the end of that anchor with your hammer the whole time. Tip number two about these little anchors. When you see me drill into this slab, I'm going to go all the way through the slab. If this was a two foot thick slab, I'm going to go several inches past what is actually necessary. The last thing that you want to ever do is drill into your slab, not drill deep enough, start driving that anchor in place, it gets halfway through, and then all of a sudden you realize you didn't drill it deep enough, and now you can't take the anchor out to solve your problem, <laughs> and you've got to lift the lift up over the anchor in order to even move it to a different location to start over again. So that's why I like to drill all the way through the slab till I hit dirt. 
make sure that it is deep enough that way I can get that anchor in the hole as deep as possible this is also important because the deeper in the hole that the anchor is the stronger it is if you were to put this in there with one inch of depth it would just bust the top of the concrete right off the lift would fall over you'd kill yourself and you wouldn't have to worry about it anymore okay so now we've got our tower stood up I've got that one there I've got the other tower over there I've got them aligned to my chalk line and then I've also got them spaced the proper distance as per the manual now one of the things that I just want to warn you of is intuition may get to you here and you think well we'll go ahead and grab our hammer drill we'll put our five holes in the concrete for that one our five holes in the concrete for that one that's the wrong way to do it guys don't get ahead of yourself there's a method to this madness don't just run off and drill all the holes at once we're going to show you the right way to do it all right so now it's time to start drilling my holes one of the things that you're going to notice is it's really difficult to drill the holes in the front right here because the carriage is in the way so before i raise up the carriage i'm going to go ahead and reach inside and i'm going to pull out the cable so that they don't get in the way i'm going to put my foot down on the bottom of the lift so that it doesn't uh, fall over and then we're just going to grab it and raise it up. Word from the wise, having done this many times before, go ahead and raise both of your carriages on both towers to the exact same height. It's going to make everything a lot easier when you're trying to hook up your cables later. Another word from the wise, be careful. Recognize that by raising up your carriages while the base plate is not anchored into the concrete, you've raised the center of gravity of this tower. This is the easiest time for that thing to fall over and hit somebody. Be really careful with these towers while you got them stood up with the carriages raised up and they're not anchored into the concrete. Okay, we're now going to use my SDS hammer drill here. We're going to verify that again we are lined up with our chalk line, that our spacing is correct, and it's time to drill our first hole. Okay, so I got my first anchor hole drilled. It's really important that you take an air blow gun and blow all the dust out of the hole as well as try and blow the dust out from underneath the base plate. You don't want that stuff caked up in between the concrete and the base plate because it'll blow out later over time, causing your anchors to get loose. But most important, blow that hole out. It's mandatory to make sure that those anchors are able to go into that hole and do their job. Okay, so it's time to get our first anchor in the hole. I'm going to squeeze out some of this AC100 plus gold onto a piece of cardboard. Once I get some of it pulled out here, I'm just going to take a uh, flathead screwdriver and mix it up pretty good. Let me stop for just one second and let you know the center of the, of the, uh, the AC100 plus gold right there is actually our catalyst. And when I, I squeezed the first bit out, the catalyst didn't want to come out. So I'm going to back up and do another shot of it to the side here and mix it up. All right, now that I've got some of it mixed up, I'm just going to roll it here onto the business end of the anchor, being sure to keep it off of the threads. Once I do that, I kind of like to spread it around evenly with my finger, like so. All right, now we go ahead and put it into the hole and drive it in. Now that I've got my anchor driven in, I'm going to start tightening it while the epoxy is still wet. Now I'm switching to my torque wrench to get some more leverage. There we go. So we've got our first anchor in there. We're going to give it a little time for that epoxy to cure and then we'll go do our next anchor. Now I'm not going to show you installing the next anchor into the hole right here because it's the same process, but what I will tell you is that I'm going to put this one in here and only after I have that second anchor in on the opposite side of the tower and I get it torqued down, then and only then is it okay to go ahead and drill the other three holes. This is basically ensuring that that column doesn't run off and wiggle a little bit on you and, and cause those other additional holes that you drill not to align. So get two anchors in place torque them down, then drill the other three. Okay, at this point, I've got all of my anchors installed. I've given the epoxy on those anchors 45 minutes to cure as per the air, ambient air temperature as well as this little chart on the back side of the tube. So now that these anchors are set into the concrete and they're solid, what I've done is I've loosened off all of my anchors so that the tower can shimmy a little bit now. I'm gonna take my level with a magnetic back, stick it to the lift, and I can start to see what it needs in order to be plumb. Now, every lift that I've ever seen comes with a set of shims like this, and what I like to do is take a great big pry bar, kind of stick it underneath the base plate, 
and I'll slide shims underneath the base plate to kind of kick it in whatever direction that I need. And as I go, this is kind of a trial and error process. I'll tighten those anchors down, you know, loosen them up, add some shims here and there until I get that column perfectly plumb. You want the first column set to the concrete and perfectly plumb before you do anything with the second column. Okay, the next step is to go ahead and wire up my limit switch. Now, I do want to mention that this limit switch came with a little cover that goes right here. You just take that off with a Phillips head screwdriver. The kicker to this is, is this thing has four terminals and I didn't know where to connect my two wires. I'm going to, just going to share with you real quick how I figured that out. I'm going to take my meter and turn it down here to resistance. And whenever I take these two little, uh, little ends here and I touch them together, my meter will go from one down to zero. So if I take these things and I touch them together to where I think they're supposed to go on this limit switch, assuming that I'm doing this right here, we're at zero. If I move my switch, it should go to one. Back to zero, back to one. So I know to hook up these two wires to those, to those two uh, front uh, ports right there, terminals right in the front, reinstall my cover, and then I'm ready to put that on the overhead crossbar. I'll add to that, it does not matter which wire connects to which of those two terminals inside there, because at the end of the day, all this does is open and close the circuit. Okay, at this point, we can go ahead and take our little limit switch and attach it to the bracket like you see here. As best I can tell, it goes on this side of the bracket. But if we're being totally honest here, the instructions to this thing are not awesome. So I might have to come back and redo this, but I think I got it right. Now I'm going to go ahead and install the bracket on one end of the overhead crossbar here. Uh, I do want to mention that I've learned over the years to take these bolts when you're doing this and put the bolt up through the bottom like that. That way the least amount of the bolt actually protrudes down into this side of the lift. That way you have as little as possible up in here that tries to interfere with your cables and your hydraulic lines. Now it's time to go ahead and install our limit switch assembly. I want to take this opportunity to tell you that this inside edge you see right here faces towards the middle of the lift. I've taken my electric cord and run it through this hole. And now we're going to do the exact same thing we did on the other end and go ahead and put our uh, bolts in place. Now we can take our safety bar, our overhead shutoff bar, put it through the slot on the opposite end, and then down here, it's just a nut and a bolt that goes through. You tighten it down at the pivot end. Now it's time to go ahead and clock the arm on the uh, safety switch here to the overhead shutoff bar. Now, I've got the overhead uh, beam right here still you know, down off the lift, so everything is upside down. So in this bar's natural position, it's gonna be like that right there. So what I'm gonna do is take my arm right here, I'm gonna put it underneath it like so, and then I'm gonna tighten the, uh, the little uh, set screw underneath there. That way, when you've got this thing on the lift and it starts pushing on it, you're gonna hear a click. And it will shut off the lift if the vehicle hits this bar. Don't forget to install the rubber grommet in the overhead bar. All right, full disclosure, I just got up on the ladder and I realized that one of my cable sheaves was so tight I could not spin it by hand. In retrospect, I probably should have put a little bit of WD-40 on that thing and got it freed up before I ever stood the towers up. Go ahead and uh, oil those cable sheaves before you stand the towers up. It's going to be the easier way to do that. All right, it's time for us to go ahead and put our overhead bar that you see right there on the top of our two post lift. This is a good time for me to mention this is a dangerous part of the install. That bar weighs about 70 or 80 pounds and we're going to be attempting to sit it up on top of those two columns that are 12 feet in the air. Make sure nobody is beneath you, especially children playing around underneath this thing while you're putting that bar up there. If that thing falls 12 feet and hits somebody in the head, it's going to be a real game changer. So definitely watch out for that. I'll show you something else that we like to do that makes things a little bit easier. You'll notice that we have wrapped, there you can, there you can see it right there, we have wrapped the, uh, the electrical cord around the overhead bar, keeps it out of the way while you're trying to do this. I'd also like to mention this is a one-piece overhead bar. A lot of you guys installing these are going to have a two-piece overhead bar, so you're going to have to bolt that thing together before, uh, you know, this point. So there you go. 
I want to take this opportunity to explain something here of why I've done what I've done. That tower right there is secured to the concrete. That tower right there is not, and it can still shimmy and wiggle very much so. I like to have one of the towers secured to the concrete to put the overhead bar in place because, frankly, the more shimmy there is in the two towers, the more difficult it makes this part of the job. So what we're going to do is carry that bar up the ladder, bolt it in to the rigid side first, and then we'll worry about getting the bolts in on the side that can move. It's just safer doing it that way. Not just that, if you were to go ahead and anchor those two towers now and you put the overhead bar in place and the holes didn't line up, you'd be screwed and tattooed. So that's why I like to go ahead and put one, one tower in anchors and then uh, you know put the overhead bar up and then put the second set of anchors in the opposite tower. All right, it's time to go ahead and take our overhead beam and set it in place. Be sure to notice how I'm taking the end of the beam that has the limit switch and putting it on the side that has the power unit. We're going to go ahead and leave the bolts on Chris's side loose and worry about getting that column set into the concrete, plumb and everything, and then we'll worry about going back up there and tightening the bolts on that side. This tower here, frankly, is more important that it is plumb and perfectly, you know, straight up and down uh, rather than tightening those bolts at the top and letting them kind of interfere how the, the column wants to, you know, move down at the bottom. All right, let me show you something important about setting the next column into concrete. So we've got that tower right there already set into concrete. This one over here, if we have a look here at the mark on the concrete, you can kind of see our little, our little red line right there that is our uh, chalk line, right? Well, you can also see a little black mark right there, which indicates the outside to outside dimension as per the manual. And I want to show you something here, okay? Notice how I can kind of get my finger underneath that a little bit, but I can't so much over here. If we have a look at our level, we can see that the unit is not actually level. So this is one of those cases where I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that block of wood you see right there, my hammer, and I'm going to shimmy that column inward a little bit. That's going to throw off my outside to outside dimension here, but frankly, it's far more important that our column actually be level than be spaced the correct distance at the bottom. So I'm going to shimmy that column in before we put this tower in concrete. All right, so now I'm just going to bump the bottom of the tower in that way until my uh, level reads that it's level. Looks good. All right, now that we've leveled our second tower, it's time to go ahead and drill our hole, our first hole into the concrete. I'm not gonna show you this process because it's the exact same as the other side. Let's do it. Now it's time to go ahead and hang the power unit. When I raise this unit up here, you're gonna notice that I've got two sets of bolts that are already put into the power unit mounting plate. The purpose of that is so that they hang right into these little notches right here. That way the, the power unit hangs itself there while you put the rest of the bolts in, get everything tightened down. I will tell you that I really recommend doing this with two people. We've seen a lot of customers over the years try and put these things up themselves, drop their power unit and bust either their whole power unit or their reservoir trying to do this. It's really a two-man job. All right, now it's time to go ahead and route our hydraulic lines. On this particular lift, the hydraulic lines are already routed up to this point right here. So all I'm doing is taking my hose, sticking it in the top side of this bracket, and then kind of just routing it through this uh, big hole right here, going out across the overhead bar. Now that I got my hydraulic line run through here, then all we're really doing is just feeding it through these uh, pieces of tubing that are welded in to the top sidebar and running it all the way across. And naturally I'm now feeding it through the holes in this upper bracket just like I did on the opposite side. Now we're going to take our electric line for the, uh, the safety cutoff switch and we're going to run it through in the exact same place that our hydraulic line just went. And that's it for the top. All right, so we've got our hydraulic line run through our overhead bar. Now we've got to take it and run it through these looms that keep it protected inside of the tower all the way down to the bottom. 
The same can be said for our electric safety shutoff. We're going to run through that as well. And then we're going to just basically repeat this three times through all three looms until you get down towards the bottom. Now it's time to go ahead and install our T-fitting for our hydraulic lines. Now I want to show you something. This is really important. The last thing that you want is for this initial nut right here to be threaded too far out that way because if you were to install it into that hole like that, it would stick off of the carriage so far, excuse me, stick off of the column so far that as that carriage came up, it would hit your T-fitting and would completely destroy it. So I'm going to thread it as far as it can go up on that T-fitting to get it out of the way. I hope this goes without saying, tighten your fittings. Now that I got my T-fitting in place, I'm going to connect my hydraulic lines to these flare fittings. No need to use any Teflon tape or anything like that because, of course, it's a flare fitting. Uh, obviously, you want to tighten these down. One of the things that I want to point out is we do have a little bit of extra hydraulic line right here that the carriage would surely come up and hit. And so I'm going to go back up to the top of the ladder. I'm going to pull that excess to where it's up at the top side. It's not inside of my tower, and that way it's not going to get hit by anything. Up here on the top side of the lift, I just wanted to show you something. This hydraulic line was probably four or five inches longer than it actually needed to be. And the last thing that I wanted was that hydraulic line to start bunching up like you see occurring right here, but instead to do it down inside the tower, because if it did, the carriage would come up and hit that hydraulic line. So in order to kind of make this a little bit tighter installation, I just took the excess on the hydraulic line, pulled it over to the sides, used some real good tape to keep it, you know, and pull everything snug so all the slack was on the top end of the lift, not the business end. Now we're going to go ahead and run our equalizer cables. These things are already attached, typically at one end to the, uh, to the carriage, and so all we've got to do is bring them up through the top and run them over this sheave. Okay, so now that I've got my cable run over my sheave there on the other column, I run it right through here, I run it over this sheave at the top of this column, it then goes down, connects to the carriage. Naturally, I'm only going to show you one of these because the two cables are the same thing. Mounting the little hangers for the truck adapter is no big deal. You just put a couple of screws in there, slide it down over. Tighten them up and set your truck adapters in place. I also want to show you that your line right here for your safety cutoff actually runs through one of those two holes and comes out the backside. All right, so it's time to go ahead and run our cables into the carriage like you see here and put a nut on the back side. Now, one of the things that I want to show you, a little trick that I've done, is I've taken the cables on both ends and I've taken the second nut that goes right here completely off. I've adjusted that nut as far up as it would go. And by doing so, I'm creating as much slack in the system as possible because God knows I'm not strong enough to start stretching these big cables. So basically, I'm just giving myself extra room. After I get them all hooked up, I'm going to come back in here, screw this one on further, put the second nut on top of it. You always want to have two nuts on the end of each one of these cables in order to make sure that you can lock them in place. So I'm going to put this one on like so. Now that it's time to install the carriages in place, we're just going to put some, uh, some grease on our finger and uh, apply a good bit of it here to the inside of these holes. It's going to make those things go on so much easier when you've got those holes greased up. All right, hanging the arms in place is not that hard to do, but it's definitely a two-man job. Raise it up a little bit. There we go. All right, same thing for the other side. There we go. Now we go ahead and drop the little foot into place, noticing the flat side in the foot right there. Can you see that? That corresponds to this little piece of steel welded here that keeps it from spinning. Okay, for installing the arm restraint locks, the way that I like to do this is I pull my hardware off of here. I go ahead and, and screw these things all the way down as far they will, as they will go to the bottom, like so. Next, you take this nut here, you spin it down as well. Now what I like to do is I drop it into the hole here. And what you want to do here is this, okay? You want to rotate that arm just a little bit to where that, that lock 
falls down in there. And what I like to do now is to take a screwdriver and kind of press in on the back side so that those two arms, those two locks, you know, come in and engage each other. Now, it really, it does help to go ahead and put a little bit of pressure on this nut right here so that they don't necessarily move so easily. So I'll put a little pressure on them. I'll take a flathead screwdriver and push in from the back side. Once I've got those two arms locked nice together, see if you can see that right there. Can you see those locks? They, uh, they look pretty good, okay. Now I'm just gonna pull it back out, drop it in here a little bit so it doesn't turn, and tighten that nut all the way so that it's locked down. There we go. Once I've got the top side done, I install my spring, put my lock, my washer over it, and then just kind of compress it enough to where I can then get the other little cotter pin to go in the little hole right there. And of course, like any cotter pin, I flare it out around it so it doesn't come off. All right, now it's time to install our little hydraulic fitting that goes right here in the power unit. I did have to pull this little red plug out of there, so beware of that. They also give you this little fitting, little uh, half metal, half rubber fitting that goes right on just like that, threads into here. And based on my experiences, when you're tightening this thing down, you don't want it tight as Christmas. If you, if you tighten it too much, you'll begin to kind of flare that rubber washer out more than is necessary. So I just snug it really good. That seems to work well. Now we're gonna hook up our short hydraulic line from our power unit over to the lift right here. This is naturally a flare fitting, so it doesn't need anything to seal, no uh, Teflon tape or anything like that. I'll go ahead and connect the other side before I start trying to tighten anything down. Now these you're going to want really good and tight. Okay. For filling your hydraulic reservoir full of fluid, check your manual. It's going to tell you what you can run. In this particular case, we got ISO 32, AW46, and Dexron Mercon 3. I definitely recommend getting yourself an extra set of hands to do this because holding that jug up this high for about five minutes straight is pretty tough. I recommend filling that thing up just about all the way to the top where it's nearly ready to overflow. I'll share something with you that I have learned. Uh, a lot of times the welders who weld the safety locks in place up in here don't necessarily always clean the weld spatter off from the inside of the towers. In fact, there's a little bitty bubble I can kind of see right there. Uh, but if you find some significant weld spatter, I do recommend cleaning that off from the inside of the towers because at the end of the day, it will make that little white plastic slaughter block right there last a lot longer when it doesn't have that spatter sitting there eating away at it as it goes up and down. All right, guys, I apologize for the background noise. It started raining outside. One of the last things that you'll want to do in your installation is apply some grease up in the corners of these towers. And I like to use an old paintbrush just to kind of move it around real good and coat the inside of those corners. It makes those slider blocks last a lot longer. All right, now it's time to adjust the tension in the cables. So what I'm gonna do here is I've only got one nut on this cable here. I've got the end of the stud even with the top of the nut. And what I'm gonna do is grab this cable here. I'm gonna pull down as tight as I can. And then when I get it pulled down with somebody holding it down nice and tight, I'm going to tighten those nuts here on the back side to get as much tension as I can through the back side adjustment. And from that point, I can start tightening on this nut here on both sides to be able to adjust it. Now the way that this works is you tighten on this nut here to draw up the carriage on the other side. So what you wanna do is get the vehicle loaded where it's not sitting on the locks, take a measurement, figure out which side is the low carriage, and then come over here and start tightening on this nut. In this case, I need to raise up that side. So what I'm going to do, is put some tension in it just like you see right there and then I'm gonna raise it up off the safety locks again and repeat this process. So you always take your measurement when it is not on the safety lock and when you get ready to tighten this you set it back down onto the safety lock that way you're taking the tension off the cables and you can spin that nut without spinning the cable. So that's really about all there is to it. Take measurements, tighten on that, it draws it up. I personally, I personally like them to be just a little bit different where I can hear the locks from one side to the other, but that's just me. 
when you're getting ready to tighten and adjust your cables, it's a lot easier to do this before you extend the hydraulic cylinder, which I forgot to do. So in this case, I went ahead and raised my carriage up to where my cylinder is now down a little bit lower, and it gains me access to these two nuts right here. You basically want to clamp these two down nice and tight, and then we're going to adjust it momentarily on these nuts. After you get the car adjusted, do not forget to take this second nut, thread it onto that top side there, and then clamp them together, tighten it down. Another thing I wanted to add, notice how much thread is sticking out the top right here, probably an inch or so. Come over and have a look at it on the other side, more like an inch and a half to two inches. As I was adjusting on this side to draw up that carriage over there, in between each adjustment, I would come over here and hit the motor, raise the lift a couple of inches in order to let those things kind of get back into their equilibrium, and then I would repeat the process. You definitely want to do that and run the motor in between adjustments till you get them just right. Okay, we're ready to lift a car for the first time. I just went back and double checked all of my anchors, making sure that they were all tight as per the uh, spec in the manual, everything was good. I recommend also coming back at least once a year if you're using it a lot, every few months and just checking those anchors to make sure that they're not loosening over time, they're good to go. This is also your last final opportunity to check every bolt on this thing that you put in today. Make sure that they are all tight you want to make sure of that. The last thing you want to do is find that something the hard way that you forgot something with a vehicle over your head. Check them all. I always recommend to our customers that you hire an electrician to wire one of these things up for you. And let me tell you why. I've been doing this for a long time selling lifts and I've seen a lot of customers that have wired these things up wrong fried the power unit on day one, and when they go to the manufacturer and they ask for the power unit to be warrantied, the manufacturer then asks to see your receipt from where you hired a professional to wire it up. When you can't provide that receipt, they tell you you've got to buy a new power unit to the tune of about 500 bucks. That almost happened here today. I explained to the homeowner here how to wire this thing up. There was a communication error between the two of us. He actually did it wrong. And when we threw power to it, this is what happened. It literally blew the cord that operates the, uh, the safety overhead cutoff bar literally apart, smoke, uh, sparks, everything. We got really lucky in that our power unit and our switch was not destroyed. We had to replace this line, but it was a really good reminder that I need to tell folks, hire yourself a professional so you know your power unit is going to be under warranty. Okay, so how do you wire these things up? You've got three pigtails that are coming out of your power unit. You've got a green ground, you've got a black that's hot, and a white that's hot. Now when you're bringing your power from your shop into it, if you were just connecting all three of those, well that would be pretty easy, right? Green is ground, everything else is hot. When you go to wire in your electric shutoff switch, this is actually going in one of those hot lines. So you're going to have an incoming hot line that's going to connect to here, and then as it comes out on the other side, it's going to go to the power unit. So you're having actually one hot line that goes directly to the power unit, and then the other hot line goes through your safety switch. That's how you do that. What really threw us for a curve ball today with the homeowner was that actually the wire right here had a white and a black wire inside of here so he just naturally started connecting white to white black to black and of course bad things started happening so check your manual really well hire a professional that probably won't happen to you okay here we go moment of truth hit the button Chris that's good once you get the vehicle lifted always give it a little test just make sure that uh, it feels solid, like it's not real light in the back end or anything like that. This feels good. Go ahead and send it to the sky. Do you notice how those locks are not quite even? You hear them separated. I like them a little closer together than that. I'm going to adjust them a little bit more, but I definitely like those locks where they're separated and I can hear both of them and that I know they're working. All right, full disclosure from a so-called self-proclaimed professional. Notice here how our cables are parallel right here, right? Over here on this side, notice how they cross. Do you see that right there? They're together, they're crossing. The reason for that is because down here on the bottom, 
they're actually reversed and they need to be flopped around. So basically, we put our cables on a little incorrectly and didn't realize what had happened until just now. Thankfully, it's not any kind of a big deal that's hurt the lift or caused any, uh, you know, big safety concern. But obviously, I'm going to take this car off of this thing and uh, fix that. I just wanted to show that with you guys, so hopefully you don't repeat what I just did. All right, guys, this is Ian here with RedlineStands.com. I'm going to put a link down below in the description to the two post lifts that we offer. Our website is RedlineStands.com. Our telephone is 901-351-4764. I would ask, if you don't mind, click the subscribe button down below. Follow our YouTube channel. We try and post a lot of good content like this. As well, if you don't mind, click the like button down below, the thumbs up. We appreciate you guys doing that. As well, leave your comments down in the bottom of this thing. Ask your questions there. We'll have a little public discussion and everybody else can learn a little bit more. We appreciate you taking the time to watch this. We appreciate your business. You guys take care. Thanks for watching.